Africa, the mother continent. Today we know that the first steps toward humanity were taken more than five million years ago on these dry, dangerous plains. But 70 years ago, when the forbidding caverns of southern Africa surrendered their first tiny skull, it ignited one of the greatest controversies of 20th century science. That fossil would spawn struggle and heartbreak, triumph and outright fraud. And its discoverer was Raymond Dart. humanity know of the world if it hadn't been for the people who've discovered. We're not likely to know the future until we know much more about the past, not only on Earth, but elsewhere. And that's what we're doing. We've learnt about the moon during the last few years. These are all things that are obvious to anybody who's got any brains. <laughs> but most people enjoy not using their brains and filling their bellies. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Raymond Dart's discovery was the opening salvo of the Skull Wars, a brash challenge to the scientific wisdom of his day. In December of 1922, Dr. Raymond Dart embarks on what will become the great adventure of his life. A two-week journey brings him to South Africa. Dart feels cut off for the first time and cast aside. His specialty is the brain and his passion, human evolution. But no one has ever made an important discovery about either in Africa. But that will soon change through Raymond Dart's genius. Dart arrives in Johannesburg with his American wife, Dora, and a few cases of laboratory equipment. I hated the idea of uprooting myself from what was then the world's center of medicine with the giants of the profession to take over the anatomy department at Johannesburg's university. He had come from London, the world's center for the study of evolution. In the aftermath of the First World War, promising scientists from across the British Empire had flocked to the city. Among them, the young Australian anatomist, Raymond Dart. At University College, he met and worked with the giants of anthropology, Dr. Grafton Elliot Smith and Sir Arthur Keith. But after three years, Dart's dream job suddenly ended. Arthur Keith recommended that Dart take a teaching post in distant South Africa, a decision the newly knighted Sir Arthur would live to regret. Johannesburg in 1923 is a gold rush boom town that has exploded from a village of 20 people into a city of over 100,000. It's a place for adventurers where wealth is measured in ounces, not dollars. The very idea revolted me. I did not have the slightest interest in holding a professorship anywhere, least of all one newly founded, utterly unknown, as remote as possible from libraries and literature 
and devoid of every other facility for which I had yearned. But unknown to Raymond Dart, an awesome secret awaits his exploration, far closer than he dares to dream. In weathered limestone caves on the fringe of the Kalahari Desert lie buried treasures. Bones that will lure him back through the ages to the enigma of human origin. By comparison, the university laboratory seems to hold little promise. The architect had overlooked the necessity for water taps, electric plugs, gas or compressed air for the student laboratories. It was no good bemoaning our fate, however, and with a new term only a month away, action was essential. With few teaching materials at his disposal, he asks his students to bring in any old bones they may come across. In 1924, Dart's student, Josephine Salmon, brings the skull of an extinct baboon that she found being used as a paperweight. When Dart asks where it came from, he is told, the quarry at Taung. Four hundred miles away, dynamite at Taung has begun to reveal cave habitats of extinct baboons. Professor Dart is amazed. He's never heard of ancient ape fossils in southern Africa. He requests that any interesting finds be sent to him. On the morning of November 28, 1924, two crates are delivered from Taung. Dart is about to host a colleague's wedding. I wrenched the lid off the first box, and my reaction was one of extreme disappointment. In the rocks, I could make out traces of fossilized eggshells and turtle shells, and a few fragmentary pieces of isolated bone, none of which looked to be of much interest. Impatiently, I wrestled with the lid of the second box, still hopeful. At most, I anticipated baboon skulls, little guessing that from this crate was to emerge a face that would look out on the world after an age-long sleep of nearly a million years. And there's another treasure, the fossilized cast of a tiny brain. It was the brain cast that caught his eye. He was a brain-trained man, and he thought he could detect on that brain cast certain features which he knew were human-like rather than ape-like. In 1924, this is an astonishing concept. Most scientists doubt that Africa played any role in human evolution. But there was one exception, Charles Darwin. In 1871, he had predicted that in Africa, the home of the modern apes, we would find traces of the so-called missing link. The first ancient apes that had begun to look and behave like human beings. Raymond Dart thinks he may have found the skull to prove Charles Darwin right. Although I had no experience in doing this, there was nobody to whom I could turn. Working away with a hammer, chisels, and knitting needle, in constant fear that the slightest slip of the chisel would shatter the relic within, no diamond cutter ever worked more lovingly or with such care on a priceless jewel. My excitement grew as I became more convinced that the whole face would be there. 
At night, I was in a fever of thoughts about cave-dwelling apes, impatient for dawn to break. On December 23rd, the rock parted. I could view the face from the front. The creature was no giant anthropoid gorilla. What emerged was a baby's face, an infant with a full set of teeth. I doubt if there was any parent prouder of his offspring than I was of my Taung baby on that Christmas of 1924. In the eloquent silence of the ancient child's eyes, Raymond Dart knows he has found the missing link that Darwin prophesied. In that dim and distant past, before man had yet appeared on Earth, South Africa was peopled with a race of beings who were vastly superior in intelligence to modern chimpanzees and gorillas. These superior beings were more erect, relied on their feet for walking, and were more adept in the use of their hands. A creature neither a human being nor an ape, but a creature intermediate between the two. He was a person with the right bent of mind to handle that skull. Instead of dismissing it as a kind of offbeat African chimpanzee that had taken the wrong pathway in its life, he saw that it was on the threshold of humanity and made so bold at 31 years of age to claim that. Dart's announcement that he has found the missing link in South Africa will stun and amaze the scientific world and touch off a bitter 30-year War of the Skulls. London, 1925. With a brash stroke of confidence, the young Raymond Dart has rushed an article about the town skull to the journal Nature describing the South African fossil he believes to be the missing link to human evolution. At first, reaction to Dart's discovery is rather positive. Even from England, Sir Arthur Keith, the most prominent anthropologist of his era. But just one week later, the full impact of the unique skull sinks in. In an abrupt about face led by Keith, the British dismiss town. We don't know how old it Dangerous is. Dangerous to draw any conclusions. He was a baby chimpanzee. It was too young in geological Not terms. Not human line. Tom was a recent ape. Piltdown was a man. The fossil was too young a child. Not human. Not a missing link, but an anthropoid ape. The town skull from Africa contradicts the favorite British skull, Piltdown Man. Thirteen years earlier, an amateur fossil hunter named Charles Dawson had reported the discovery of an ancient fossil in a gravel pit near the village of Piltdown. Piltdown man appears to be a creature truly caught between man and ape, with a human-sized brain and an ape-like jaw. The cream of British science agreed. Piltdown becomes Sir Arthur Keith's holy relic. To him, it was the evolution of the rational mind that set us apart from our animal ancestors. It was the expectation of people at the time that our earliest ancestor came, became human in his brain and brain size before it humanized in teeth and posture. And so the comic picture 
uh, of the caveman used to show a creature that was hulking over with large fangs, usually dripping gore, but with a large brain on top of that. The Tong child had a little brain, but human-like teeth and a human-like posture. It was totally contrary to the image that had fixed itself in people's minds uh, before 1925. So far, the search for missing lynx skulls has been confined to Europe and Asia. And some find it easier to imagine the white race having evolved from Asians than from black Africans. There was a bias on the part of many European anthropologists and scientists against Africa and all things African. It was almost a racial prejudice against the African continent. The Tong skull has challenged everything the British establishment believes about human evolution. But why such passion about one tiny skull? The stakes are high. The issue, what made us human? For most scientists, it was the appearance of a large brain that marked our break from the lowly apes. But the small brain Tong child suggests that the path to humanity began with the body, not the brain. Raymond Dart finds himself trapped, alone in the middle of one of the most passionate debates of his time. Who are we, and where do we come from? If Dodd wants to prevail, he will need help, an ally. He finds one here in South Africa, Dr. Robert Broom, a contemporary of Sir Arthur Keith, a fellow of the Royal Society of London. An expert, Broom has already sketched in one branch of the tree of evolution by finding the reptilian ancestors of mammals. A hands-on, experienced field scientist, Broom has spent 20 years searching South Africa for bones. He is also a trifle eccentric. He will do whatever it takes to protect his beloved fossils. February 8th. 1925. Dear Professor Dart, your missing link is really glorious. Perhaps I may make a trip up to Joburg for a day and pay my respects to my distinguished ancestor. With best wishes, Robert Broom. Broom was the only visitor who knew from his own experience what this was. And when he came in, uh, it, it was on a table. And he was, he was on his knees uh, looking, uh, looking at this and uh, so on. And I said, what on earth are you doing there? He said, I'm bowing before our ancestor. Though nearly 30 years oh, apart in age, off. the two men cement an alliance that will last the rest of their lives. Dart, the bold newcomer, and Broom, the veteran field scientist. Broom was convinced that Dart was right. Broom was Dart's bulldog. He was his great supporter. And it was Broom's destiny, ultimately, to find the first adult of the same kind of creature as the Taung child. But if the two men agree on science, they differ on strategy. Broom urges caution, further study. 
But Dart is convinced that seeing is believing, so he sends plaster casts of the town skull to London in time for the 1925 Wembley Exhibition of Science and Technology. At Wembley, Sir Arthur Keith, the most prominent anthropologist in the English-speaking world, is forced to line up to see Dart's reconstruction. An examination of the casts exhibited at Wembley will satisfy zoologists that this claim is preposterous. Keith is incensed. To him, it is unthinkable that a small-brained animal could be our ancestor. He condemns Dart's discovery as a mere chimpanzee. Keith's denunciation is blunt. Town is an ape, and Dart is a fool. The popular press takes up the theme. And at a time when the theory of evolution itself is under attack by some groups as anti-Christian, Dart becomes swept up in a bitter religious debate. In America, a Tennessee school teacher named Scopes goes on trial for teaching evolution. The teacher is convicted. And the idea of our ape-like origins is banished from thousands of American classrooms. To scientists by the 1920s, there is no disputing the common ancestry of apes and humans. What science seeks is the mechanism of evolution, the missing link between ancient apes and man. In South Africa, Raymond Dart knows he has held the missing link in his own hands. This forthright rejection of my beliefs made me feel that leading anthropological opinion was ganging up on me. None of their arguments persuaded me to deviate in the slightest from my earlier conclusions. Dart was a man of courage, a man who was willing to take chances, and he often did. A man who was a heretic in science. He didn't mind standing out against the, the flow of the tide. Battle upstream against the tide was how he did his science. But soon, Raymond Dart will coax new secrets from the town child's skull. The skull wars are far from over. At the close of the 1920s, Raymond Dart's revolutionary assertion that Africa was the prehistoric cradle of the human race has been dismissed as preposterous. Dart believes he has found the missing link. By day, Dart is preoccupied as the newly appointed dean of a university medical school. But at night, he works to expose the biting surfaces of the ancient town child's teeth. After working on the fossil on and off for the last four years, I have been able to separate the lower jaw from the upper jaw and to reveal clearly that it is human in almost every detail. This was the mouth of a meat eater, and in it Raymond Dart beholds not merely a fossil, but a lost world recaptured. 
We never knew before an ape which lived on a cliff or plateau, on the fringe of the desert. It was an animal hunting, flesh eating, shell cracking and bone breaking ape. I quite expected that this would uh, cause trouble because one was dealing with the history of the earth and how man came to be. How he rose. And this had been, at one time was the sort of thing that his previous peoples had, had, gone to, had to go through in order to become men. To me, it was reality. Well, it is real. <laughs> to eat like a human being, the town creature likely lived as one. Soon, Robert Broom sees the truth for himself. When Dat removed the lower jaw, it was seen that the milk teeth of the little ape are exactly like those of human children and not in the least like those of the chimpanzee or gorilla. Dart is ready to take on the world. In 1931, Dart travels to London, armed with the skull, to speak at a crucial gathering of the Zoological Society. When I arrived in London, Early in February 1931, I felt confident enough to tackle anything. Here, in my spiritual home, I was sure I could influence my colleagues to accept my belief that I had bridged the gap between ape and man. But Dodd is upstaged by news of a spectacular new missing link from Asia, Peking Man. In a cruel twist of fortune, the first man to speak is Grafton Elliot Smith, Dodd's original patron and mentor. Elliot Smith's impressive presentation hails the discovery of Peking Man in China. And Peking Man seems to mesh exactly with England's big-brained Piltdown relic. The exceptional thickness of his skull and the similarity of its architecture to that of Piltdown Man are unexpected features, affording strong confirmation of the kinship of the early man of China and England. Once again, a large-brained skull has overshadowed Raymond Dart and his African missing link. I stood in that austere and chilly room, my heart pounding. I realized that my offering was an anticlimax, a pitiful difference between this fumbling account and Elliot Smith's skillful demonstration. I could only stand there, with the tiny skull in my hand, telling the audience what I saw as I looked at it. The rejection of the town skull is total. Now more than ever, scientists look to Asia and Europe as the home of the missing links. But soon, the world will learn that the town skull is just the first of Africa's secrets, thanks to the incredible discoveries of a 70-year-old fossil hunter and a 14-year-old boy. Now working at the Transvaal Museum in Pretoria, Dr. Robert Broom, though nearly 70, moves to the front line of the War of the Skulls. As there seems to be no other way of convincing the world, I resolved in 1936 to hunt for an adult skull. Broom needs an adult fossil because many scientists think the town child is too young to be conclusive. Everyone knows that the features of a species really emerge after puberty. Could you tell from a little 
baby boy of so, such tender years what kind of an adult it was going to grow up into. So they said, we want an adult before we'll be prepared to talk turkey with you. In August 1936, Broom sets out on his quest, working on a tip from Dart. August 12th, 1936. My dear Dr. Broom, one of my science students has been digging out fossils from a cave deposit at Stirkfontein and would be delighted to show you what he has found. destiny will guide him toward a great discovery. He spots the skull of an ancient baboon, just like the one first found at Taum, 400 miles away. And Broom wonders, could Dart's eight men have lived here too? Broom finds he has an ally in the quarry manager, George Barlow, who has been collecting fossils also, not to study them, but to peddle them to tourists. Mr. Barlow, who supervised the quarrying, was there to look after the visitors. Barlow had once worked at Taung and knew something about the skull. On a large table, he had a lot of specimens that he had collected and sold to visitors. I asked him if he had seen anything like it at Sturkfontein, and he replied that he rather thought he had. On the Monday following August 17th, 1936, I was again at Cirque Fontaine. And when I saw Barlow, he handed me a beautiful brain cast and said, is this what you're after? I replied, yes, this is what I'm after. It was clearly the brain cast of an ape man and in perfect condition. And so the next crucial clue in the mystery changes hands for a handful of change. For the next two days, joined by quarry workers and the staff of his museum, Broom combs the rock piles for more fragments. Again, fate guides his hand. He finds a partial skull with four distinctly human-like teeth. With the help of the quarry master, Broom has found the next vital clue in the Skull Wars. Broom returns to Pretoria with the fossil he christens Miss Sturkfontein. He writes to the one man he knows will share his excitement. September 18th, 1936. My dear Dart, you will be interested to hear of the progress of Miss Sturkfontein. She has turned out to be a trump. The two allies meet every week when Broom lectures in Dart's department. But Dart finds himself too overwhelmed by his university duties to help Broom analyze the Sturkfontein skull. Broom must tackle the fossil on his own. Miss Sturkfontein's facial bones have been crushed and twisted by the weight of the rock that encased them. But the expert broom envisions the bones as they must have been in life. The teeth of this Sturkfontein girl are almost entirely human. And in my opinion, there can hardly be any doubt that she is closely related to the ancestor of man. 
Here, at last, is a mother for the town child. Broom Skull proves that the town creature belonged to an entire race of missing links, who once called Africa home. Now it's Broom's turn to try to convince the world that humanity arose on the dry plains of South Africa. In 1937, Broom is invited to the United States to a conference on human origins. In New York, at the American Museum of Natural History, Broom enlists the support of one of the most powerful men of American science. Dr. William King Gregory an expert on fossil teeth, decides that Broom's discovery is important enough to bring him to South Africa to take a closer look. But at the conference, Broom finds Miss Sterkfontein is upstaged. A large-brained fossil from Palestine grabs the spotlight. Yet again, a Piltdown-like skull eclipses the small-brained skull from Africa. Robert Broom returns to the South African quarries to search for more specimens, more proof. His uncanny luck continues. In June of 1938, his old ally Barlow hands him a fragment of jawbone. It has been found in a farmer's field by a teenage schoolboy named Gert Teblanche. soon found and drew from the pocket of his trousers four of the most wonderful teeth ever seen in the world's history. These are promptly purchased from Gert. I had the pallet with me and I found that two of the teeth fitted perfectly onto the pallet. Gert told me about the piece he had hidden away. He took me up to the hill and brought out from his hiding place a beautiful lower jaw with two teeth in position. <laughs> Broom concludes that this creature from the Chrome Dry Farm was much bigger than the other African fossils. So more than one species of ape man once lived here, on a continent most scientists had believed had no role in human evolution at all. Soon after this vital discovery, William King Gregory arrives from New York. Broom shows him the caves at Sterkfontein and the fields of Cromdry. The American authority throws his reputation behind Dart and Broom. The expression missing link is an inaccurate one today. Dr. Broom has found it. It is no longer missing. There are now three important skulls from Africa, representing two species. But still, the world believes that the big-brained fossils of Europe and Asia are the model of evolution. And one skull, above all, is held up as proof. Piltdown Man, the British missing link, still revered honored with a monument unveiled by Sir Arthur Keith. But there can be only one true missing link, and the moment of truth is near. The final battle of the War of the Skulls will include the exposure of one of the most infamous scientific frauds of the 20th century. By 1938, the large-brained fossils of Europe and Asia still impede the universal acceptance of the African origins of mankind. They are championed by a man of extreme pride and extreme power. Sir Arthur Keith, Piltdown's greatest advocate. This bitter contest for the truth has been fought since the 1920s. 
But now, the Second World War intervenes. In South Africa, as troops are mobilized to join the Allied forces, blasting at the limestone quarries is halted. And Dr. Robert Broom eagerly uses the wartime hiatus to prepare his own scientific battle. Broom, at the age of 72, in painstaking detail, compiles the complete history of the South African missing links, which Dart is called Australopithecus. First, the child from town, the upright meat-eating hunter. Then Broom's own discoveries, the town child's parent, Miss Sturkfontein. And the second race of missing links from young Gert Terre Blanche's treasure trove. All creatures with humanoid teeth, small brains, and erect posture. Evidence that they had begun to live like humans. And Broom's book contains one more revelation. The rocks in the African caves containing the skulls were much older than anyone had thought. For the first time, Broom has proof that the small-brained African ape men lived before the big-brained fossils, Piltdown, Peking Man, Palestine Man. And soon, the world is convinced. Broom receives congratulations from around the world. Grudgingly, even the champion of Piltdown Man, Sir Arthur Keith, writes to Robert Broom. March the 12th, 1946. My dear Broom, I hasten to congratulate you on a magnificent piece of work. You have placed the Australs definitely on the map of man's past. Dart began the job but it is entirely to you, to your sheer intuition, your energy and enterprise that has ended in such a harvest. A truce to the differences of opinion, I have acquiesced. Yours warmly, nay affectionately, Arthur Keith. Finally, in a letter to the publication Nature, Keith surrenders to Raymond Dart, the man whose work he ridiculed for 20 years. I was one of those who took the point of view that when the adult form of town was discovered, it would prove to be near akin to the living African anthropoids, the gorilla and the chimpanzee. I am now convinced that Professor Dart was right and I was wrong. By 1946, Dart and Broom are no longer outcasts. And as more and more evidence of primitive man is found in the weathered gorges of South Africa, Robert Broom and Raymond Dart finally are hailed as pioneers. By 1950, the evolutionary pathway of the human race is becoming clear. The African skulls, with their small brains, are the oldest missing links found so far. Town. Chrome dry. Far younger are the bigger brained fossils Peking man, the Neanderthals, and finally, modern man. But one mystery remains England's Piltdown man. The big brained skull with its ape like jaw is totally unlike any other fossil. By 1950, so many more ape-man fossils of Australopithecus had been found in Africa that Piltdown had become a veritable enigma. And looking at the question, one of Dart's former students, Joe Viner, came to the conclusion that the only way that it could be explained was if it had been fraudulently salted into the gravel at Piltdown. 
travelling back to Oxford one evening after a conference at which we'd been discussing the full-down problem, I was wondering how one could possibly explain the curious contradictions of these finds. Well, then it occurred to me that one possibility might well be that someone had deliberately placed the parts of the cranium with a broken jaw of a modern ape. Viner is exactly right. Laboratory tests show Piltdown to be an elaborate counterfeit, a human skull only 500 years old, with the jaw of a modern orangutan. The jaw rapidly yielded critical evidence. The molar teeth had been filed down to give a human-like wear pattern rather than an ape-like wear pattern. The joint of the jaw, which joints it to the base of the skull, that had been deliberately broken away so that the telltale giveaway evidence was removed. The other giveaway evidence of an ape jaw is in the chin region, and that had been smashed away. The newspaper soon announced the death of a creature that never lived. A sin against science that endured for more than 40 years. But who was its perpetrator? The shocking news of the forgery becomes a media event, a prime time topic for discussion on the BBC. First of all, have another look at the picture of Dawson. Here it is. Is it the face of a fanatic who would mislead his colleagues so cunningly for so long? Or is it the face of an enthusiastic amateur who was hoaxed and misled by some ill-wisher? Perhaps we shall know for certain one day, but perhaps we shall never know. What we do know And the Piltdown fraud continued to fascinate scientists. The suspicion lingered on. Where would Dawson have gotten an orangutan jaw? Where would he have got a 500-year-old human skull? So knowledge and access to material raised the thought that Dawson must have had a co-conspirator. And 40 years later, after 1953, Ian Langham of Australia, Frank Spencer of New York, supported by myself, came up with, the, with evidence to suggest that the co-conspirator was none other than the great British anatomist, anthropologist, Sir Arthur Keith. If he was guilty, Sir Arthur Keith was responsible for selfishly blocking the understanding of human evolution for nearly half a century. Keith's name tops a long list of suspects in a mystery that may never be solved. The scientists who won the Skull Wars lived long enough to reap the full rewards of their victory. In his 50-year career, Robert Broom, the great fossil hunter, amassed more ancient ape-man skulls than all the other scientists in the world combined. Robert Broom died in 1951 at the age of 85, just before the exposure of the Piltdown forgery. Raymond Dart returns many times to the caves and quarries of South Africa and lives into his mid-90s, the grand old man of the missing link. During his lifetime, Africa gives up a treasure chest of fossils, filling in the evolutionary tree of the human race. And since Dart's death, other scientists have made more spectacular discoveries in Africa, pushing the threshold of humanity back beyond town. And it all began with the discovery of a child's tiny skull, blasted free from a rocky tomb on the edge of the Kalahari Desert. <laughs> 